Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue working on the Class C amplifier circuit that I built last time by trying to improve on the overall efficiency. Now documented Class C amplifiers are known to exceed 90% of efficiency, so it is possible, but the question is what exactly do you need to take into account to actually achieve this and also can I make such a circuit? Well, if you're curious, then keep watching. So efficiency, at least for the test that I'm carrying out today, is defined as the ratio between output power, the useful RF, and the input power, what is being drawn from the power supply. To make a fair evaluation, for the input power I will consider the sum of the power stage and the transistor driver. So you could choose a really low loss transistor, but just driving it will take a considerable amount of energy. So that should not be neglected. Now regarding the efficiency analysis, there are two big things to keep in mind. Every single component and every single interconnecting trace are contributing to the loss. There is no such thing as an ideal lossless component in the real world. And the second thing is that just because something is creating loss does not mean you should actually focus on it. It's important to identify the major contributors and start from there. So what are our main problem areas? Well, last time while doing the thermal imaging of the circuit board, there were two main hotspots, the first inductor and the gate driver. So a good place to start is by analyzing these two components. Let's look at the gate driver first. How can we reduce the power loss without actually changing this component? Now the issue here is not the gate driver, this component has fairly low current consumption by itself, but rather the issue is the load that it has to drive. The transistor, this particular component, has about 150 picofarads of input capacitance. So the gate driver is charging and discharging this capacitance in every single switching cycle. And this is where most of the power is getting lost. So regardless of gate driver, the transistor still needs to be switched. So this particular switching loss cannot be fixed from the driver side, but rather the solution is to change the transistor with something that has smaller capacitances. So if we do change the transistor, what exactly should be the criteria by which we select the new one? Well, when analyzing the losses of a switching MOSFET transistor, there are three big categories. On resistance, this will impact the conduction loss, the various capacitances, these will mainly impact the gate driver losses in this particular application, and finally, the switching speed. So in a switching amplifier, you need a transistor that can actually provide very fast transition times. And after a quick search, the component I found was this one, the BSS-316. This comes in the same package, the SOT23. It has a similar voltage rating, around 30 volts, and it also has a SPICE model available. So all of the basics are covered. But when we look at our three main efficiency related categories, first of all the on resistance at 4.5 volts is 280 milliohms, with our other transistor it was less than 190, so with the new transistor it's around double. The capacitances in general are around half, so the other transistor had 150 picofarads of input capacitance, this one has 71. And finally when we look at the Switching times, this transistor has a sum of rise and fall time of around 3.3 nanoseconds under standard conditions, whereas the other transistor has around 20 something. So other than the on resistance, this new transistor should be better. Now without going into calculations, those would just take too long, we can perform a quick spice simulation just to see if indeed the new transistor is a better solution. For that, I prepared the circuit that we have with ideal components, and I already adjusted the capacitor in the new circuit so that the switching waveform looks as close to ideal as possible. So if we run the simulation, we can have a look at the power getting dissipated on the two components. So first of all on the two transistors, the old transistor has around 16.6 milliwatts, 
while the new one has around 7.8. So this is about half of the power dissipated on the first transistor. So even though the conduction losses have increased, the decrease of the switching speed has provided a sufficient benefit. Next, to evaluate the driver side losses, I didn't really have a model for the transistor driver that I'm using, so I'm representing this with a pulse square wave and a series resistance. So we can get an idea of the power getting dissipated on the driver by analyzing the power dissipated on this series resistor. So in the old circuit we had around 56 milliwatts, while in the new circuit it's around 8 milliwatts. So this is the real benefit of the new component. Our gate driver should now have a much easier life because of the reduced gate capacitance. So even though this transistor is not perfect, it should give better results for this particular application. The other big problem we had was the first inductor. This was clearly heating up during the thermal measurements, and unfortunately, this is one of those topics where to get an improvement, you need to choose the least bad compromise. The topics to consider are physical size, core material, and cost. This particular circuit has three inductors, and while the same general improvement rules will apply to all of them. First topic to discuss is wire resistance. Any wire will have a DC resistance, the one you can measure with your standard ohmmeter, but the AC resistance, the resistance that can be observed when an RF signal passes through, will always be larger and frequency dependent. This is caused by skin effect, the phenomenon in which the current that flows through the wire tends to flow on the outside of the conductor, and the distance the current enters into the conductor is a frequency dependent parameter. The distance is smaller at higher frequency, and in a standalone conductor, this current will get uniformly distributed on the outer perimeter. Since the current does not flow through the entire mass of the conductor, the resistance increases compared to the DC version in which the entire mass is being used. Now, in a coil, you also get proximity effect, the phenomenon in which the current from one turn impacts the current from the adjacent turns. The current in adjacent turns flowing in the same direction repels, and the current from one side of the coil to the other, flowing in opposing directions, will attract. So the current distribution within each conductor in a tightly packed coil is even more reduced. Therefore, the AC resistance in a coil will be larger than the basic skin depth prediction. To counteract this, there are three main approaches. On the one side, you can use thicker wire, so to have more copper for the current to flow through. You could spread out the turns, so increase the distance in between them. By doing this, the impact of the current from one turn to the next is reduced, so your proximity effect is reduced. Or finally, you can use a magnetic core, something that has magnetic permeability, so that you reduce the number of turns altogether. Now, at this point, I thought I had it all figured out. I will use short thick wire on a magnetic core. What could possibly go wrong? So, the core material that I was able to get is this type 61 ferrite from ferrite. I chose this particular material mainly based on its complex permeability graph. So, any magnetic material will present real permeability, this mu prime, which creates inductance, and it also has imaginary permeability, this mu second, which creates resistance. So, in an energy storage, element like our RF inductors, we want the real kind of permeability so that all of the energy that gets stored in the inductor is given back to the system. However, in something like an EMI ferrite, we want the imaginary kind of permeability which will take the RF energy and turn it into heat. Now, this particular material is nice because at our frequency of interest, so at 5 MHz our switching frequency, it is very clearly inductive and this property is kept into the 20-30 MHz region. So this should cover not just the fundamental switching frequency, but also part of the upper harmonics. So this material should be fine. So I got some cores, put a bit of thick wire on them, and made the first test. Now, I will not focus on recreating the experiment just now, but rather highlight the result. 
the magnetic core ended up heating up to around 40 degrees Celsius. I made a circuit that was worse than the thing I analyzed last episode. But why? So the other important parameter to keep in mind regarding a magnetic material after confirming the permeability is the core loss dependence on magnetic flux. So again if we come back to the datasheet we have this very nice graph indicating that the core losses are dependent on the magnetic flux going through the core and this frequency of the alternating current. So with higher magnetic flux or at higher frequency core loss will increase. And since this is a logarithmic graph, something like a doubling of the magnetic flux will have a very significant impact on the power loss through the core. So it's one thing to choose the right core material, and it's a totally different thing to choose the correct physical size of the core. Having that figured out, I was confident again. If I reduce the magnetic flux, the core loss will reduce. Now, I did not have any other dimensions of cores around, so I put the coil over two of these cores. And well, it was better. The core only reached 30 degrees Celsius this time. So in the end, this is an important design decision. Adding a magnetic core will reduce the wire losses, since there is less wire, but now you get core losses. Some core materials are better than others and you need to dimension them accordingly, but you need to see for each use case which is the most efficient way. You need to balance the reduced wire loss with the new core loss. For example, in the case of the radio frequency choke in this circuit, a magnetic core was more or less mandatory because of the amount of necessary inductance. Last time I used the 330 microhenry inductor, even though the calculations only required 91 microhenry, so this time to improve on efficiency, I got a proper 100 microhenry inductor in the same case size. This was better in practice since the DC resistance was almost half, but then I went one step further and used my fancy cores and got an even better efficiency. So core losses did not disappear in this case, but they were far smaller because of the reduced magnetic flux. So for this particular part of the circuit, the AC current ripple is extremely small compared to the output resonator. But with the other inductors, it was back to air core. I first made an inductor using 0.3 millimeter wire, and now the hotspot moved to the core on the output inductor, so I changed that as well. I used 0.75 millimeter wire because why not? And at this point, well, I could make the first inductor with very thick wire as well. So this has got to be one of the ugliest things I've ever built. I mean, other than the overdimensioned components that are all over the place, it just seems sad that the actual switching transistor is almost invisible in comparison to everything else. And don't forget, this was supposed to be a half watt amplifier, which is outputting 0.3 watts. But was it worth it though? So just before starting with the measurement, Let's have a quick recap to see what's different with this circuit compared to the one that we measured in the last episode. So first of all, the transistor driver is the same. The transistor is different. I used a lower capacitance one. And other than that, mainly all three of the inductors have been changed. So I tried to use lower loss components. Finally, the rest of the components have been left the same other than, well, the capacitors having their values slightly fine tuned. So. Let's turn on the circuit. We can see on the first channel of the oscilloscope that the output is a nice sine wave. And now we can proceed to see the various waveforms. So first in blue, we can see the signal in the gate of the transistor. It's sharper than last time. So the gate driver is having a easier time driving this transistor because of its lower capacitance. And we can also have a look at the switching node. So it's not perfect, but it does have the nice falling slope, which is changing its angle right at the bottom. So it's not perfect, there's still a bit of ringing, the exact point at which the transistor switches is not perfect, but this was the closest that I could get it. Next, we can have a quick overview of the thermal performance. So the only element that is actually heating up is the gate driver, and well, to a certain extent, we did expect this, 
all of the inductors have their temperature close to the room temperature, so we're not really losing power anywhere else. And finally, we can perform our efficiency test. So for that, I connected the ammeter in series with the supply. So when we turn on the circuit, apply our square wave, we have our output signal, we are drawing around 64 milliamps, and the supply voltage is at around 4.89. If we also factor in the 3.83 volts of RMS output voltage, this gives us a global efficiency of around 94%. So a very good value. And next, we can also measure the efficiency of the power stage by itself. So to exclude the gate driver. So I bypass the gate driver to be directly supplied. We are now drawing only 60.7 milliamps. And the supply voltage is around 4.905. So the efficiency of the power stage by itself is around 98%. So as long as you're taking care of the various parasitics and take every measure possible to reduce these to a minimum, the class E amplifier can be made to be extremely efficient and you can get fairly good results with it. So in the end, what have I personally learned from this project? Well, first of all, never forget about parasitics, especially with inductors. These will be the biggest loss contributors of all the passives. So keep inductors as small as possible, make sure the design uses the smallest possible inductor values necessary for the desired operation, and compensate for this using capacitors since those have much smaller losses. And finally, leave space for mistakes. The board does not have to be small if efficiency is a concern. And with that said, I hope you got some useful information after this. Leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated on my videos and see you next time. Bye bye.